yesterday we chose, I was sitting on the chair, we presented a um, joint work on how to model quantifiers in the scalable composition distribution form. So basically since 2008 that we came up with the categorical composition distribution semantic model, we've been trying to model more and more linguistic phenomena, so coordination was an example, we did quantifiers yesterday, and then um, giving thanks to Michael Mortcott, who unfortunately couldn't be here, so the moment he saw that they're working on quantifiers, he said, ah, oh, but how about quantifier scope? So there's an ambiguity when you have quantifiers in language. And in this work, this very small piece of work, nothing important about it at all, so I just show how you can do quantifier scope ambiguity in the way we treat quantifiers in this model. Okay, so we model quantifiers using generalized quantifier theory uh, applied to natural language as Barwell and Cooper do, uh, where you start with a context-free grammar, like so. Um, so your sentence is generated by a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase, verb phrase is a verb followed by a noun phrase, and more importantly for this talk, a noun phrase is generated by a determiner followed by a noun, where this determiner guy, uh, looking into the terminal loop, can be all of the following, A, some, all, no, most, few, etc., etc. Uh, um, so these are your, um, these are the things that give rise to quantifiers, these determinants. Um, Slideshow and then just move the mouse oh, away from sorry. the control. Oh, really? okay. I'll end the slideshow. 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 Okay. okay, so right. Um, so once you have your syntax yeah, on the left, then you want the semantics, and they use um, set theoretic semantics where you have a universal reference U and this semantic map. Uh, so the semantic <coughs> map is used to assign sets or uh, over the universe and products of the universe to the terminals uh, of the language. So uh, noun phrases, nouns, and intransitive verbs or verb phrases, they become subsets of the universe. Um, and then verbs, transitive verbs, they become subsets of uh, the product of the universe with itself, relations over the universe, binary relations over the universe. And more importantly, these uh, determiners, they become maps from parts of the view to parts of the parts of the view, which you can think of as a relation over parts of the view. So a map from parts of the view to parts of parts of the view is a relation over parts of the view times parts of the view. So once you have it for words, you ask, what about for phrases? And then everything beautifully and compositionally extends to phrases. For example, the meaning of um, a noun phrase built by this rule, a determinant followed by a noun, like um, some cats, is just uh, the meaning of your determiner applied to the meaning of your noun. The meaning of um, your verb phrase, verb followed by noun phrase, is just the meaning of the verb applied to the meaning of the noun phrase, and the meaning of the sentence, noun phrase followed by verb phrase, is the meaning of verb phrase applied to the meaning of noun phrase. Nice beautiful. What are sentences? Um, the sentences get a binary meaning in the plural as true false. The meaning of a sentence is, built like so, following that rule, is true if and only if uh, its semantics, which we defined inductively using phrase and word, is the non empty set. If it is non empty, then you say the meaning of my sentence was true. Okay, um, there are some, uh, if you want, restrictions or axioms on the semantics. One of them, the most important one, is called conservativity, which says uh, an element of D applied to N is also, uh, an, uh, D, X is an element of D applied to N, if and only the intersection of X with N 
There's also an element of the afterlife you have. And this is otherwise known as the living on property that the quantifier lives on its first argument. And it's to make such sentences equivalent, like all professors know during talks, <laughs> the same as all professors are professors who snore. Um, can somebody give me an example of a quantifier which doesn't have this property? So, for example, only doesn't have this property. Only professors who snore is not equivalent to only professors or professors who snore. So, so this means that we are restricting our viewpoint to quantifiers that have this property. Uh, all right, okay, so here's an example. Uh, some men snore. The meaning of some men snore is verified like this. You take the meaning of uh, some men sneeze. You take the meaning of sneeze, you intersect it with the meaning of man, and then you check if this is in the meaning of some men, which is a set of sets, right? So there's a set, there's a set of sets, you change what something is an element of something else. So contrast this with um, the natural view that you have of quantifiers <coughs> in the logic where you have variables, and here there, there are no variables around. So that was one of the tricks that made the whole thing work. Uh, so what we had so far, uh, were presented by Bob and by Dimitri, is that we start with Bitrup grammar, we have this functorial passage, they come back close category, and then if you instantiate that to vector spaces, you get the composition and distribution of semantics that we had. What we face here now is that we have a context-free grammar, and uh, <coughs> we need to add something that's called bi-algebras to this categorical composition distribution of semantics model, the intersection operator. Uh, and then, um, because we started with generalized quantifier theory, we have the notion of truth and falsity for the meaning of sentences. And the question arises as um, our model here is very abstract. Does it actually uh, include what we started from? Is it equivalent to what we started from? Then we show that if you instantiate this abstract model into sets and relations, you actually get the soundness and completeness theorem with regard to truth defined as in generalist quantifier theory. Uh, the passage from context free grammars to pre group grammars turned out to be worked out during uh, years, like decades, since 1930s to uh, 1990s. So if you then compose various different ways that context free grammars are turned into different uh, forms of grammar, at the end you get two pre groups. So this sigma map has been worked out. So <coughs> from this to here and then here to by algebra, instantiate to relations, get general quantifier theory, instantiate to vector space, and you get your normal composition distribution for uh, So um, I was going to explain a little bit what these by algebras are. Hmm. If you were here yesterday, I'm sorry to <coughs> hear it again. Uh, so by algebras, uh, over a semantic compact loss category, see uh, this is the tensor, this is the unit of the tensor, and that's the symmetry morphism. While the rows are tuples like so, uh, where this x with the first three elements is an internal monoid, which means we have these two morphisms, and the second three elements form an internal co-monoid, means we have this morphism, and they satisfy these axes. Uh, Diagrammatically, this is your monoid, uh, this is your co-monoid, and this is one of the axes, which is the most important axis. Um, so this is like the merging operator that Dimitri was mentioning, but it's not the same, and this is the dual of that merging operator, the copying, if you want. So, uh, so that was the abstract definition, you essentially have two sets and relations. It turns out that we have to work with a power set object, so these maps, we instantiate from power set to power set, of to power set times power set, from power set to the unit of tensor in red, which is the singleton set, and then the other way around of these two to get the commonoid. And this is how we define them. So um, this is, uh, the, the first operation is just a normal uh, copying, the Frobenius copying, if you want, that Dimitri was using. What is new is that we define a new uh, uh, monoid map, which when you have an A and B connected to the C, where this monoid map, what we do is that we check if C is equal to the intersection of A and B. So that's how we enter the intersection into the models. It wasn't there before. 
And then by this canonical embedding that you have from uh, certain relations to uh, vector spaces, the, a set goes to the vector space spanned by the elements of the set, and that the relation goes and becomes a linear map, then everything smoothly transfers over to vector spaces. Uh, so, uh, what do we obtain? There are abstract compact closed semantics. This sigma is a translation between the context field gamma and the three groups, and we get this categorical morphisms as the meanings of your terminals in the context field gamma. They correspond to this shape, if you like the diagrams more. So noun phrases, nouns uh, are just elements of a designated vector space W, which has a bi-algebra on it. Verb phrases are rank 2 tensors, W tensor S, transitive verbs are rank 3 tensors, W tensor S, tensor W, and the quantifier is a map from W to W. Um, conservativity corresponds to, um, so we define a D map, and we take it to be equal to this morphism, so that's the axiom of conservativity imposed <coughs> on the compact closed category by algebra. And diagrammatically, you look like this. Uh, you see the by algebra here. So then the monad algebra. Something like all men sleep then has this form for all. You put your meaning of your quantifier. This was the meaning of man. This was the meaning of sleep. Then you pull your strings accordingly, and you get this as the meaning of a quantified sentence. Uh, you can quantify the uh, object, many like all cards. Again, compositionally, you'll get something like this. And then you take one step back and you say, well, okay, abstractly we have these diagrams, but if we work with sets and relations, we we'll have these sort of symbolisms. And what is the connection between these two? Is anybody uncomfortable about this at all? The people who work on this model. But you, you draw these nice diagrams, and then these are very different. How do you show that they're equivalent? Does it scare you that one day you can prove that they're equivalent? Nobody, I, I, I lose sleep because of this. <laughs> <laughs> but finally, Jews prove that for this case, for the case of these diagrams, and if we define this um, by algebra map the way we did, then we do get this nice uh, soundness and completeness theorem. So if you then define the meaning of a sentence to be true in the relational instantiation of the abstract of a closed uh, categorical model to be true, if and only if you can connect uh, the unit of tensor to a unit of, unit of tensor with the meaning of the sentence that's defined, then you can show that the meaning of the sentence is true in the relational instantiation, if and only if it was true in the general loss quantifier theory as I defined it in the first two slides. Okay. All uh, right. Okay. How about quantifier scope? So we have quantifiers, and uh, probably it's well known that if you have a sentence which in which you have two quantifiers, one on the subject and one on the object, like so, quantifier one, noun one, verb, quantifier two, noun two, all men admire two cars. This sentence has two different meanings. So the first meaning is this meaning where all men in the set of men admire some two cars. They don't have to be the same two cars. And the second meaning is this meaning, where these two men all like two very specific cars, Lamborghini and Jaguar. So, um, so how can we show that our quantifier model also gives rise to these two different readings? Um, so example of formalization of this sentence is this two different first order logic readings. So you have here for all, and then there exists. And for the specific two cars, first you have exists, and then for all. So here you say for all has wide scope, and here exists has wide scope. So in one reading, Q1 has only wide scope, and in the second reading, Q2 has wide scope over the full sentence. Really? Okay. Uh, right, okay, so how do, how do we solve this problem? Um, so you sit down and analyze it, and I'll just uh, read one of them. So this one, uh, D1 has wide scope. So you first um, look at your verb, and then retrieve its codomain, 
and then check from the codon when you retrieve the elements that are in the quantifier relation with the codon man, so your specific quantifier, all men or some men. So first you retrieve men that like something, and then you check if this is all men or some men or two men, and then you go back and check if these two men, the things that they like, so this V A gives the things that they like, the A's are the things that they like, then you check if this A is in the domain of the first quantifier. So you first evaluate the second quantifier, and then you apply the whole thing to the first quantifier. And the order of evaluation is what is different in the second reading. First you evaluate the uh, first quantifier, the one at the beginning of the sentence, and then you evaluate the second quantifier, which is at the end of the sentence. So there's an order in the evaluation. Uh, so these two difficult looking formula become simple in our setting. So in our setting, I put a bar on top of the semantics. So that's what you get for the wide scope of V1, and that's what you get for the wide scope of V2. And then once you get there, it's very easy to have diagrams for it. Uh, so this, first you uh, verify the D2 and then the D1, so white scope for D1. And here first you evaluate D1 and then D2, white scope for D2. And then you could play the unfolding game because we define conservativity, right? So you can, uh, instead of D2, you put its conservative version and you get an unfolded diagram. And similarly for the other reading, so that's not a problem. Uh, so that's for the ambiguity part. And then we get to branching. Uh, so Henke, I, I guess, was one of the first people who actually observed this partial order between the verifications of the quantifiers that give rise to the ambiguity in the quantifier scope. And then later, Hintika in 1973 argued that this phenomenon also arises in natural language. Uh, people were not so convinced until Barwise in 1979 showed loads and loads and loads of examples that. Uh, uh, appear in natural language, arguing that whenever you have a model quantifiers in natural language, you have to show how it branches. So branching, uh, you denote by this. You have your verb, you have your uh, quantified subject, you have your quantified object, and they branch to quantify the verb. So that's easy, you can just denote it like this, diagrammatically. Uh, <coughs> I'm not doing anything big at all. So now I've shifted the diagram from top to bottom to left to right, and you see it's exactly like the branching diagram. You have one and two, and the verb here, convert subject, verb, convert object, verb. It's exactly the same thing, except that you put contents for N1 and D1, for N2 and D2, and for the verb. But I say you don't have contents, you just put the symbols. So these two things are exactly the same. What makes it work? It's like Barwise defined in 79, you have to really define what the semantics of your verb is to get these two different quantification orders. So if D1 and D2 are monotone, this is what you have to do. And if D1 and D2 are downward monotone, this is what you have to do. I won't go through the details, but this is exactly what we can do in our model as well. So when we define the relation of instantiation of the model, we have to define the semantics of the verb. So we say start is related to sets A and B, even only if application of the relational version of star to A is equal to B. Now here we can make it more refined, saying if D1 and D2 are upward monotone, we have to refine the equality to V of X being a subset of Y. And if D1 and D2 are downward monotone, V of X should be a superset of Y. And in this case, you get one reading, and in this case, you get the other reading. So, uh, I'm done. So I have one advice and one future work. So the advice is, uh, I don't know if anybody else ever wants to extend this model to other fragments of natural language. But if you want to do, never feel restricted to pre-group grammars, because I mean, the furthest away from pre-group grammars are probably context-free grammars. So there's this translation, which you can go through, have been worked out along decades from the 30s to the 30s <coughs> by different people. And I bet even if you have a triadjoint grammar or head first first structure grammar, you can still find a translation to pre-group grammars and analyze a natural language phenomenon that you want using these kind of translations rather than starting from a pre-group grammar, which may be restrictive sometimes. And the future work is that, uh, as you can see here, we have, we have to give two different 
encodings of the verb, where the case quantifiers are upward morphon or if they are downward morphon. Um, and that is not very compositional because there are two different cases. How do you know from the start when you're hearing your sentence if these quantifiers are going to be upward or downward morphon? And then what's the style in this paper? appeared in a volume edited by uh, Peter. He actually puts them together and shows these two conditions together. Shows when, when you can have just one um, condition for branching. And my goal is to make things compositional, like him, and not to just have one condition on the back. Thank you. So somebody's got to ask this question, so I'll ask you. What about donkeys? Oh. <laughs> Every farmer who has a donkey beats it. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess generalist quantifier theory doesn't suffer from the donkey paradox. That is just when you translate from first order logic, from natural language using Montague's translation to first order logic, right? Okay, but sorry, my, my question oh. was, was uh, actually, I, I wasn't trying to be disruptive. Um, <laughs> so, so you've done work on relatives, <coughs> and yes. this fits in with. Okay, so there should be a positive answer you can give rather than just a story problem. But maybe it's too okay. complicated an answer. So there. what was the question again? Then? So well, well, how does a donkey sentence work in okay. the context where you have your you have your theory of how relatives work and you have your theory of how quantifiers work? Does it still work if you put them together and 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 what goes on? What happens? I think so. So I've been actually practicing this to answer a different question, but yes, I think if you put the provenance of the um, relative pronouns together with the provenance of the quantifiers, you might get even something that people complained about yesterday. Um, and that is, when you define your by algebra the obvious condition, um, which we actually haven't used at all. So we think if you actually have a, the provenance of a relative pronoun together with the by algebra for the quantifier, you might get uh, using these kind of conditions to move things around in the sentence to make things apply to things that are far away from them. Uh, yeah, I'll be checked for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, Ross? Uh, so, uh, am I right in thinking that all relations can meet with the... Uh, this multiplication. Uh, you have this uh, set intersection which does the multiplication which is intersection of sets. Uh, this guy. Right. So if I have a distribution or a relation below it, I can always push it through and copy it. Is that true? Uh, because they're duals? No, so because of the way you defined it. Uh, why? So this is how it's defined. So you need the same relation. Yeah, that's my point. So <laughs> okay, any oh. I have one small Quick. Uh, this, this both for you and Dimitri, you still put on these humongous expressions with symbols and nobody can read them. Yeah. Okay. I mean, just keep the symbols. No, no, earlier. This I mean, when, you, when you're defining it, where it is. Yeah. Nobody understands that it helps people who can read it. It helps some people who who are still grounded in old school formal semantics. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's okay. We're okay. happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you again, Thank you. Thank you.